Great. It looks like we have everyone in the training. Thank you for joining us today for this training on strategies for recognizing and working with survivors of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking. Today, um, we are joined by Lamer Kyle Griffiths, and Lamer is the Director of Training and Complex Litigation at Still She Rises, and by Chelsea Foreman, who is the Assistant Shelter Director at Domestic Violence Intervention Services, or DIVIS. And this training, as you know, is hosted by Housing Solutions, and we'll be covering a variety of topics. So we are, um, Lamar and Chelsea are gonna talk about the types and impacts of domestic violence, about the prevalence and intersectionality of DV within the homeless population. Um, they're also going to cover the legal rights of survivors, as well as best practices for working with survivors. And they're also going to talk about the role of advocates and the referral process. And we've saved ample time for Q&A. So folks are welcome to send questions through the chat as they come up. And I'll be tracking those and uh, bringing them up for Lamar and Chelsea. You're also welcome to um, unmute yourselves at the end at the time that we've saved for Q&A. Um, and ask questions then, so whatever you prefer. Uh, please also note we'll be emailing a pre-recorded about 30 minute overview of the goals of the Violence Against Women Act or VAWA and its requirements for COC funded programs. So that piece uh, will be emailed separately after the training and you'll also receive some supporting template forms. Um, I, again, please send questions through the chat and please note that um, just before the end of the training, we're going to deploy a quick one question poll to see if the training was helpful for you and a Google form where you can let us know how we can make trainings more helpful. So watch out for that at the end. And as I pass it on to Lamar and Chelsea, I'm also going to send some links in the chat to two handouts. Um, I'm going to send the power and control wheel and also a handout on protective capacities. So watch out for those. Uh, I'm gonna send them in just a minute and now I will pass it on to our speakers. Thank you both. All right, so as Sasha said, my name is Chelsea. I'm the assistant director at the DVIS shelter and I have Lamare uh, joining me if you want to say hello. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> I'm Lamare Kyle Griffiths um, and uh, do the training, um, which is actually ends up any, being internal and external trainings like this, and then also litigation in at the uh, Still She Rises office. Cool. Okay, so we're going to start with an overview of what domestic violence is and how it may present. Chelsea, I think you might be frozen. Computers, they work for us, they work against us, they make our lives more interesting. <laughs> I guess I could give a brief overview right now. We have a slide later, but I could go ahead and talk a little bit about Still She Rises. So, um, Still She Rises works with women uh -oh, that are charged um, in criminally in the system, in the legal system, and also works with women who are in danger of losing their parental rights. We also do work with housing, so in eviction courts, um, and we work with some, some women around benefits and um, so occasionally small claims come up and things like that. The uh, organization of our office is holistic, and what that means for us is that we really try to work with women and address future success, as well as whatever legal event got them involved with our office so that so that implicates some interesting mixes because a lot of other public defense style offices indigent defense style offices really sort of basically deal with a case and then 
move on. Um, and we uh, are fully designed. Our entire mission is to really try to address um, some of the root causes and some of the ways that someone can stay successful um, either at, even after getting entangled in some of these legal spaces. I was hoping that I could riff long enough that she would come back. <laughs> Looks like Chelsea's computer crashed, so she's restarting it. Oh no. Okay. Uh, guys, my computer completely crashed. Oh. Okay, there's a shot of adrenaline to start this presentation off. Let me share my screen again. I'm so sorry. <laughs> It's okay. I did a I did a longer explanation of Still She Rises and what was going on with well heart attack. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. So with domestic violence, a lot of the place where we want to start is about types of abuse. Um. So people are pretty Kelsey, familiar. Yes. I don't think your screen is shared. Good to know. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Can we all see my screen now? Okay, lovely. Okay, so when we're talking about domestic violence, we wanna start with talking about types of abuse. Um, so a lot of these are pretty familiar to all of us, not really surprising. Um, stalking, harassment, physical abuse. We tend to forget financial abuse, that if someone earns income and doesn't have access to that income, um, that's an, a form of power and control and abusive tactics. Um, sexual abuse, lots of survivors don't realize that even in a marriage or a committed relationship, you can be sexually assaulted by your partner. Um, emotional abuse, psychological abuse, which is also known as gaslighting, I think is getting a lot more familiarity in culture right now, and then also religious abuse. So all of these are different ways that we may see abuse manifest. Um, but what's important to remember is at the very root base level of domestic violence and any type of abuse is this dynamic of power and control. So the perpetrator is engaging in behaviors to exert power and control over their partner. Um, and this is when we distill it down to this really simple balance of power and control, it makes it really easy to identify things that are abusive that may not register as abusive immediately. So anything a partner does to control a survivor um, can be forms of abuse and it can vary widely from survivor to survivor. Um, so on this slide and one of the handouts that you guys have been given, is a power and control wheel. And for domestic violence providers, that is like our bread and butter. We love a good power and control wheel. They have power and control wheels for traditional heterosexual relationships. They have them with um, forms of power and control in like LGBTQ or gender minority relationships. It, it essentially creates a visual that lets us see all the different prongs of power and control and then gives us some language of what that might look like. So for this example, we have using economic abuse, and then it lists a series of examples of what that may look like as a form of power and control. Uh, if you're ever bored and like wanna read a bunch about domestic violence, just Google like insert any marginalized or unique identity here and then power and control, and it will give you lots of cool resources in Google. It's, it's just a good way to think about how power and control may manifest differently um, in various relationships and situations. So then the question that comes up all the time is why do survivors stay? When you're in this work, that feels like a really frustrating question because there's any infinite number of reasons why a survivor would stay. I'm not gonna read this. I typed this list up in about two minutes, just like spitballing, like the reasons I had heard in the last week a survivor stayed in a relationship. Uh, I think what's much harder to ask and like really look at are questions around like, why does the perpetrator continue to engage in power and control or why like, why, what barriers are there for the survivor to leave? So, so much of the time there are like systemic and societal barriers. Um, we'll talk a bit more about the intersection of domestic violence and homelessness, 
Uh, but one of the huge ones is there's not sufficient, like safe, affordable housing for survivors, which I know is why a ton of you are on here is that's your heart song. You're in this work of homelessness prevention and intervention, but it, the list is infinite why a survivor may not leave. It's hard to leave and it's unfamiliar and it's scary and there's so many unpredictables. And yeah, it, I don't want to spend a bunch of time because we all know there's so much to it. I think that's, um, I'd pop in and say the one that has always spoken to me is mistrust of systems, of course. Um, and it's interesting because that mistrust of systems can sometimes come from outside of the relationship itself. So there's a mistrust that builds if, if someone is trying to leave and has interacted with the system and that system has let them down in some way. But there's also just times if they were raised in families that you know interacted with systems in ways that were not good or somebody who was um, failed by the school system or who um, all of that sort of system um, distrust and insecurity um, just gets exacerbated when there's then this this additional issue of violence. Absolutely. And that, yes, already touching on that intersection of if you have mistrust of a system from one experience, one intersection, and then you compound it with domestic violence, like, yes, absolutely. Okay, so now we're going to talk a bit more about that intersectionality because it runs all the way through every ounce of this work. So let's take a moment. Um, I would love to hear from you guys how you have met survivors or how you've engaged with a survivor in your work and how they talk about their experience of domestic violence. Or how might that look different for the different people you encounter? So what are some of the unique experiences you've had working with people who are survivors? Folks, you so, have, oh, I was going to let everyone know, you can unmute yourselves. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, my name is Annabelle. I'm with uh, SAM Ministries. I'm a prevention, homeless prevention. Um, but uh, recently, I've interacted with someone I was trying to relocate, um, but uh, she's refused any type of services like the homeless shelter for abused women. I think they would uh, give a lot of uh, resources for her, but she just doesn't want to go. Um, and obviously we can't force them, but that's, that's my experience here recently. That's a very real, that's a very real experience. Yeah. Well, here at the Salvation Army, I'm Ginger, and we get the people coming in and saying that the shelters are full for Divis or Springville, Spring Day Villa, and so they end up staying with us short term until they can get in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we see all gamuts of left to right with their emotions. So yeah, we just we just keep asking them to check back and see if they've got any openings, and that's about all we can do. Absolutely. This is Sheila Harbert. I um, work, I work at twelve and twelve. I work, which is an inpatient rehabilitation uh, uh, unit, and a lot. I'm in the pilot program for women who were addicted to meth, who are overcoming that addiction. Wow. And in that class, a lot of them have stories are. Before they came to rehab, they were abused. I mean, horrific stories about violence and abuse. And a lot of these ladies are in a situation to where when they complete the class, you know, when they complete rehab, where are they gonna go? You know, and so as case managers, you know, we're looking at ways like how can we help them at their next level? But a lot of them have been, you know, in violent, domestic violence situations and are afraid, you know, uh, going back to that same environment with their partners or their husbands or so I've had about, you know, it surprises me how many I do see in that situation in my class. Also, I've seen people with traumatic childhood, so it's almost normalized by the time they become adults. Totally.
Lori in the chat said I've recently interacted with a individual who was brought here from a different country and then when she arrived here her partner started the abuse. Yeah, that these are all like such real like the realest messiest examples of how domestic violence shows up. I think and all of them highlighted like really complex intersections of homelessness and substance use and immigration and like, yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's a messy, messy thing to have to, to, to work with and to collaborate with survivors on because it's not just one thing. It's, it's a lot. For sure. Does anyone have any last thoughts that they want to add to this before we move on? It's a lively bird there, Lemaire. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so digging into a little bit of that intersection, a lot of the thread I heard was um, lack of access to safe housing options and like transitional housing or shelter housing. Um, so looking at the intersection of domestic, domestic violence and homelessness, um, every year there's a poll nationwide of every domestic violence shelter. So we just had it on like the 12th, I think, where they ask every single need that an agency couldn't meet, what was it? And nationwide, 63% of unmet needs were all related to needing emergency shelter for domestic violence. So it is like a nationwide trend that domestic violence shelters are packed and full and unable to shelter and house people. Um, also, 57% of homeless women report that domestic violence is their primary cause of homelessness. So it's the majority of women who are experiencing homelessness identify that domestic violence is the root cause. Um, and then 38% of all domestic violence survivors report homelessness at some point in their lifetimes. So these are some really significant numbers indicating that intersection that domestic violence and homelessness is a very, very real trend. And it's something that us as housing providers, as substance use providers, as shelter caregivers, case managers, we're going to run into these intersections a lot. So then looking at domestic violence and the intersection of race and ethnicity, um, this chart I took from um, the Office of Violent Crimes, um, so OVC, and they are giving us information about rates of domestic violence according to race. Um, so you'll notice that a vast, so Native American and Black individuals are experiencing domestic violence at higher rates than white individuals. Um, also looking at that individuals of multiple races experience domestic violence at higher rates than anyone else across the board, um, which is significant. It, it paints a picture of the survivors that we should be encountering and we should be serving in this intersection of the work. And then also looking at the intersectionality of domestic violence and LGBTQ plus individuals. Um, so you'll see that LGBTQ individuals for the majority are going to experience domestic violence at a much higher rate, um, domestic violence, sexual assault and stalking at a much higher rate than their heterosexual counterparts. Um, which is huge, that's a significant trend. There's also research that shows that um, LGBTQ individuals, only 5% of survivors will report those crimes or seek out support from systems. I think we can all think about how systems may be scarier or maybe more alienating for someone who has a gender or sexual identity minority um, or an orientation mi minority. Um, it just feels less safe to access those systems because those systems aren't built for them. Um, and then also holding that 50% of transgender individuals will experience interpersonal violence in their lifetime, which is, that's a phenomenal statistic to me. It's always staggering. I think it's 25% of women will experience domestic violence. So that being doubled for a trans survivor is really incredible to me. So this, I, we share these slides to highlight again, the complexity of the survivors when they're going to be presenting to us and the complexity that we need to hold as we're engaging and creating services for individuals in our communities to make sure that they are inclusive and they are attainable and they are 
approachable for these um, minority identifying individuals to access services because they are more likely to be victimized according to the national data we're seeing. All right, Lamare, I'm gonna kick it to you for a minute. <laughs> Yay, all right, so I wanted to talk here a bit about the intersection of different legal systems. Um, the, the issues are very similar, you'll see, but they are different depending on the different systems. So I'm going to talk through briefly mainly the criminal system, the juvenile family parental rights system, and the housing system, housing and benefits. Um, there are different pieces that inter intersect, and the interesting part about the legal rights and legal systems, how they intersect with survivors, has varying effects that we'll talk about. And some of those effects end up being internal effects. So um, how somebody will talk about or if they're willing to disclose domestic violence and how that appears. And then also how those external systems sometimes receive information from different providers or make um, assumptions for back, lack of a better word about what it means um, if somebody has received services or partially received services. And the first part is the criminal, uh, the criminal legal system. Um, and it impacts people. Um, we see an interesting impact here. So there are people oftentimes who are accused of crimes that are survivors of domestic violence. Um, part of what you'll see on the power and control wheel are things like the isolation um, and the psychological abuse gaslighting piece. I think this is where this pops up. It's very difficult at times because I know there are um, several organizations and things that talk about basically denying people if they are accused of crimes. And what's been interesting, so my, um, I've been a public defender, defense lawyer for um, 20 years and primarily worked with men at the beginning of my career now working with women. And it's very interesting to see that gender makes very little difference. So I have seen now the system play out and be abused in the same way against women um, as it was that I saw for years with men. So some of what happens in those relationships is a great way to isolate somebody is to get them accused of a crime. And the impacts of that last much longer than that crime. So I may be able to do a wonderful job defending them and get them released, get the cases dismissed, but that still is always gonna show up um, and not always. Sometimes we can do further work to get it expunged, but that sometimes takes years depending on how the case winded through the court system. Another thing that pops up is the use of protective order court. Um, people can get emergency protective orders with frankly very little information. Um, there are pieces of that that are wonderful for survivors and people who are attempting to get out of situations, it is, also, um, it is also able to be abused. And there's another dynamic that plays out in protective order court because um, I think because it's a civil court and not, not exactly a criminal court, there isn't as much push for people who are requesting a protective order to have to follow through with that protective order. So what I've seen a lot of times in looking at people's records is protective orders that go back and forth. Um, and a lot of times what will happen is a perpetrator, someone who's trying to um, get out of a situation will file a protective order against someone. And then some of the, the threats or the promises to do better, or some of the other pieces of that power and control wheel play out the person requesting it, the woman requesting it doesn't show up. And then that and then that sort of triggers into that mistrust of systems. So then when they come back again, somebody looks and says, well, you didn't show up before. Or they hear that used um, against them in some other court proceeding that they have. <clears throat> and you end up in a space where people no longer request the help. So sometimes if they are appearing um, at Divis at a shelter and someone says, have, have you requested a protective order? Um, and when they say no, some of that is that manifestation of a mistrust of systems. And then there's a really interesting dynamic because when there are criminal cases, and when I'm thinking of this, this comes up in the sort of assault and battery realm, especially, um, when someone has said, I was abused, I was hit, um, there are oftentimes no contact orders 
that get placed on somebody. And um, again, that is a way that can be used as a way to control somebody um, because as soon as the domestic label goes, and it was, of course, all of these systems were set up for protection in some way, um, but there are people out there who can then say, oh, there's a no contact order here. Um, and then people have to disclose or feel like they need to disclose that they are court ordered not to be involved in something. Um, they're court ordered to be away from somebody or to be a certain amount of feet away from a person or a household. And that can really impact their ability to say remain housed, even go to certain um, shelters or take advantage of certain types of protections or um, benefits that are out there um, depending on the structure of that order where they can be and where they can't be. Another place this shows up is in housing and benefits. All of the isolation that can happen is, is if somebody tries to leave um, or has the police called on them, for example, that can trigger them being unhoused or making that decision about whether or not they're going to stay in that situation if they are going to, and this sometimes happens if police are called and nothing happens because there are plenty of times when police are called to a particular household and nothing happens um, or the police are called and the fear and the control has come back into play. So the, the sometimes perpetrator who has called the police is able to say, oh, it's solved now, um, but has demonstrated their ability, their power to call down authorities on um, the person who's a survivor of domestic violence in that situation. Um, there's also times when police are being called by other people, and sometimes it's a, a race to the narrative. So it is who says first what happened that can frame the entire event. Um, because of this, there were policies that were put into place in a lot of police um, scenarios, lots of law enforcement that call for the arrest of both people. So there's this additional situation that can occur that if police are called and are called by a perpetrator, let's say, or called by an outside party who hears a fight, a perpetrator, if they get there first and say, oh, this person hit me, and can show, oh look, I have some kind of mark that I can attribute to that. Um, and, then, and then the person who's a survivor says, no wait, no, I got hit. They run the risk of both being arrested. So this is sort of another area and that can impact their housing, right? There are times when if somebody is causing lots of um, ruckus, for lack of a better term, if they are deemed to be um, committing acts that are problematic, that involve law enforcement, they could end up being asked to leave or evicted. Um, and there are times when uh, the person that is trying to survive this relationship doesn't feel empowered enough to say, but wait, that's because I keep getting harmed. Um, that's because this person is yelling at me and, and that, um, and that, that's why um, that's why police are coming here. That's why there are these loud noises. Um, people don't feel empowered to say that because there is a large fear that if they are evicted from certain places, that they won't be able to find anywhere else. They won't be able to be housed. They won't even be able to sometimes access other benefits that normally people would say are easy for survivors to access. And then there's the parental rights um, and family cases. So there's a very interesting and strange relationship between domestic violence and parental rights. Um, one of the ways that a child can be removed from a family is if there's domestic violence in the home. Um, there is definitely, this is one of those interesting areas, again, where the thought behind it uh, was protective. Of course, we wanna protect children from um, adverse childhood experiences. We wanna save them from, um, we wanna give them the chance to start off as well as they possibly can. But there's an interesting tightrope that comes 
for um, especially women who are saying, well, wait, I survived domestic violence and I'm supposed to tell people and get help for that. And then the family system that will sometimes turn that around and say, you allow domestic violence to occur in front of a child or including a child and therefore you are not a suitable parent. So this is another way that systems um, that in theory were built to help can sometimes end up oppressing and suppressing the statements and the explanations about what's going on. So what might be able to save the family from more violence might open them up to separation. So they might, if they try to leave, if they try to interact with some providers and then are having to disclose if DHS gets involved um, and then they're trying to disclose that, they could then be, um, and honestly this works sometimes criminally charged, but also um, be impacted in the juvenile court where someone says that they don't have the right to see their children or they have to work through specified services. And if they don't work through those services in a certain way, that their child may be removed um, from them forever. And that can be fueled, how that plays out can be fueled by what's reported. So um, when people talk about somebody not engaging with services or say they um, refused certain types of services, there are some interesting interplays there. And again, that may play in with the mistrust of systems. Um, it may play in with vulnerability. It may play with, um, as we'll talk about a little bit, sort of racial, gender, identity, expression issues of what people feel like they can say safely. Um, there is also a large distrust of whatever I say today, if this situation isn't perfectly taken care of, and as we know, like, we don't often have the resources to solve someone's life um, because they have come to us as a survivor and said, um, what can you do for me? Oftentimes we can't make everything right. And so if it doesn't end up perfect, it might be better, it might look better, it might be more protective to go back into that relationship because, um, because no one's involved in it. If, they, if a mother doesn't disclose that they um, have been involved in domestic violence, they don't have to worry about their children being taken away um, and don't have to worry about their family being separated. And there's a terrible, terrible choice um, to make there um, between violence, being unhoused, disclosing and possibly being removed from your children. Um, and there are a great many mothers, I believe, that opt for just being silent. I cannot echo enough. Like, I feel like I bobbleheaded the entire time you were talking, but that is so, like everything you said is so deeply ingrained in like <laughs> every ounce of this work. So yeah, I just, I had to acknowledge that and like stamp that as like, yes, 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 ma'am. Um, okay, so now we're gonna, sh we've talked through some of the barriers, we've talked through the complexities and the intersections of working with domestic violence survivors. Now we're gonna unpack a little bit some of the best practices in working with these complex cases. So everything we've touched on is all like touch points of trauma. So experiencing the violence is trauma, engaging with systems is traumatic. Um, someone had contributed that a lot of them have witnessed abuse as children or been in abusive situations and have ACE scores. Um, we know that trauma is a thing. So it's important that we're engaging in trauma-informed communication um, as we're working with these survivors. So a little bit of the 101 tenements of trauma-informed communication are for you to stay calm. It's really common for survivors to come in at a 10,000 and it's reasonable because they are in their like fight or flight panic trauma response. So our job as the professionals that they're engaging with are to like center ourselves, produce as much calm as we can, and then hope that the survivor picks up on that biofeedback. Um, I like to joke that when we're taking crisis calls, we'll like really intentionally breathe in deep through, our, like breathe loudly into the phone, not like a creep breathing, heavy breathing on a phone, but like that we're really intentionally taking deep breaths to regulate ourselves. And when our bodies and our minds and our voices are regulated, the survivors will pick up on that. And I know like that sounds like some kind of wild woo-woo hippy-dippy stuff, 
um, but it works. Like seven years of frontline crisis experience, like I promise you it works if you are centering yourself and staying calm. Um, making sure that you are acknowledging the feeling and validating whatever feeling the survivor has. So we may not understand why the survivor is terrified. They may be dumping all of this stuff that doesn't feel scary for us in our scheme of the world, but we can see that the survivor is afraid and we can name that. And again, there's something really, really powerful to naming whatever feeling they have. If that's anger, if that's fear, if that's overwhelm. Um, I don't know if you guys have experienced, but when someone names your feeling, it kind of deflates the intensity of the feeling a little bit. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big feeler, <laughs> so I know that works for me. And again, we, we know it works for survivors. It's a best practice there. Another huge thing is not to make promises. A lot of the times we as helping professionals will try to say, it'll be okay, things are gonna get better. If you call the cops, they'll take care of you. The system will protect you. Um, these are things that we say to make ourselves feel better because this is an uncomfortable situation to be in this space, holding this really complex, really messed up, really gnarly situation with these clients. Um, so keep in mind that us making these promises and trying to say these like little soothing sentences are more for us than for the survivor. It's much more impactful for us to say, wow, that's overwhelming. I can see how you're feeling scared. Now for us, that doesn't feel good because we're kind of out here floating without trying to make anything better. But that's what's more important to that survivor is that someone is acknowledging like, this is scary, this is overwhelming, this feels wild and crazy and out of control. And for us as professionals to say like, yeah, you're right. It, it sounds like things are really out of control right now. Let's brainstorm some options or let's explore what our resources are or what your options are. We're not saying everything's gonna be fine. It's a, it's a shift in conversation. Also suspend your judgment. I cannot say this enough, especially when we're looking at the complexities and the intersections. And I love that someone from 12 and 12 spoke up and said, Lots of their uh, people who have been experiencing addiction are also survivors of domestic violence. We have to remember that these survivors have complicated lives and have done complicated things to survive their experiences. So for us, suspending that judgment and meeting survivors where they are at with as little judgment as we can is so important. Um, identifying the survivor's strengths and resources. This is huge for us. So our survivors are going to come to us with abilities, with strengths, with capacities that we can't even fathom. And if we get into a cookie cutter mindset of this survivor is yelling and she's mean and she's angry and she's uncooperative. No, 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 we need to reframe that and say this survivor is a survivor that her response to fight, flight or freeze, her traumatic response is to fight. What am I doing and what is the system doing that is bringing up this trauma response in her? Um, <laughs> thank you, Lemaire. Uh, I When I'm training new employees, we do like 20 minutes just on survivor's use of force as like a response mechanism. They've had to fight for their lives for so long. So yes, yeah. Yes. It, it, <laughs> It's so true. And it's, and it, and it's also interesting because I think the interplay and you make it to this is the interplay with trust and the ability or difficulty in, um, uh, building trust relationships when, when trust has been harmed so much that, that also impacts that. And that, you know, that behavior is, is survival, right? So, yeah. And not to play off that, not even just like generic trust relationships, but like the most intimate relationships where you should be able to trust has been damaged. So like me walking in as some random chick with weird hair, like how am I going to form that trust? Quit like it. You you have to think about how you're being perceived as like a stranger coming into this situation, and then yes, absolutely holding that complexity and how that survivor is going to respond, and then how to shift those things that seem complicated into strengths and resources and not necessarily like barriers or complexities. So we at the shelter, it's guaranteed you're gonna have a survivor that is a strong advocate for themselves. And our language years ago might've been, she's complicated, she's challenging, she's hard to work with, but our language has shifted like, she's a strong advocate for herself and we need to name and hold that. And we as the providers need to learn how to work with that and serve that to the best of our abilities. Like, we need to identify their strengths and center around that client. That's how we do trauma-informed care and communication. 
Also, I cannot say enough the importance of demystifying the process. So when we have survivors engaging with legal systems, telling them like, when you go file a protective order, you will get a temporary protective order right now, and then you have to go back in two weeks. If that perpetrator has not been served in two weeks, you'll have to go again in another two weeks. So if PERP is avoiding service of the protective order, being upfront and telling the survivor, you're gonna have to be in court every two weeks until this person gets served. It informs them and lets them make the best decision that they can. You can also, one of the first things I'll say when I'm talking to someone about a protective order is reminding them that it's just a piece of paper. <laughs> if, if you are afraid for your life from this partner, protective order is not gonna stop a bullet. It's not gonna reinforce your doors and windows. It's not the end all be all. And if it's going to exacerbate things, we might not mess with it. It might not be the safest or most valid approach. So this is where like, we have to use both sides of our brain, our logical side and our super creative side to meet survivors where they're at and think as much as hard as we can and as creatively as we can to, to balance all the complexities that are happening with these clients. And then another huge thing is giving the survivor space to lead the conversation. I will say a significant amount of the time, if I sit in silence, like silence is one of my favorite techniques and open-ended questions and just letting the client go, you will get so much more rich information. Um, we had an experience recently working with a partner agency where they were trying to get the survivor to relocate because they weren't safe in an area. And they were so focused on getting them to a domestic violence shelter that they missed that the survivor had safe protective family in another state. And if we can just slow down and like sit in that openness and sit in that comfort of like, we don't know what's right for the survivor, the survivor knows what's right for themselves, we can get so much more information and identify resources and tools that we can tap into to make us a better advocate. Or they may say something that says like, oh, if this is your only concern, let's figure out how we can work with this concern. But if I kind of get stuck on my role or get stuck on anticipating what they're going to say or stuck in my judgment, I'm going to miss a lot of those things. So slow down, let the survivor lead the conversation, demystify the process, suspend your judgment. It's a lot of things to hold. And really, if you can just think like, this is my job right now is to just hold what we're talking about and be curious. It takes you like 10 steps ahead in the process. So a huge part of this is that active listening piece. Um, <clears throat> I said one of my favorite tools is silence, and that's interplaying into this active listening. So when you're engaging with a survivor, pay attention, keep your eye contact, ignore the other things happening. So if a survivor's talking to you and you think of an awesome resource and you're like, oh, I just want to dig for this pamphlet, suspend that movement and just engage with them for that moment. That feels so much more connected. They feel so much more heard. Um, one of my favorite techniques to teach is to take out a blank sheet of paper and take notes on what the survivor or your client is saying. How many times in your life has someone emphasized the importance of your words by taking notes? Like it creates this pedestal of power and importance of their language and their needs. So take notes. It, yeah, <laughs> and then it, that allows you to put your thoughts on hold. So I know we're all care providers. We want the best for people. We wanna brainstorm. So we're thinking like, ooh, I need to remember, I need to say this because they said this thing that's really important that I need to follow up on. Write it down, then it's out of your brain and you're reconnected with what that client is saying. That's huge. Yeah, and I think that's one of those things too. I also tell people the reasons I'm taking notes. I'm taking notes because I, this is so important and I don't want you to have to repeat yourself. I want to be able to like do this. And then I, sometimes I have lots of squares and circles and things on my, on my piece of paper, or even sometimes if I'm typing, um, that'll say things like, you know, this is the thing I want to bring up later or after, afterwards I want to talk about this. Um, and there's also a piece to, um, I want to say the, the the intentional breaking of eye contact. So if you've had the discussion with the survivor with client saying, I'm going to take notes, I'm going to do something, and they've said something particularly emotional or something that they, they seem to be wanting to hide from, or at least sort of that kind of thing. There are sometimes when you can say, when you can take that eye contact down and take your notes, do the thing, and re-engage while they sit in the silence. Yes. 
And that, again, coming back to that silence is so powerful because their minds may be racing and they may just need a minute to get their thoughts together. So us sitting in that silence, such a good follow-up point. Um, showing you're listening, nodding, reacting, facial expressions. We joke right now with our masks, you can only see half of our face, but like having expressive eyebrows to what they're saying. And you can furrow your brow and you can surprise eyebrow. Just respond to them saying, oh my gosh, that's so scary, or please go on, or tell me more about this. And then also providing feedback on what was said. So as you take notes saying, I really want to go back to this thing that you told me, or this felt really, really important. Let's dig into this more. Oh, my cat has broken into my new office, so she's going to join us. <laughs> I'm so sorry, y'all. She's unstoppable. Um, and then again, embrace the silence. I can't emphasize this enough, how powerful that is as a tool for listening and engaging with someone who's in their trauma response or has a lot of trauma. I love this cartoon. The more sentences you complete, the higher your score. The idea is to block the other guy's thoughts and express your own. That's how you win. And he says, conversations aren't contests. And he says, okay, a point for you, but I'm still ahead. I think this is really important for us as care providers because we get focused on helping and providing solutions and fixing things. And we forget that sometimes they don't need us to fix something. They just need us to hold it with them and look at it with them or absorb the whole picture and then distill down to a couple of sentences what they've said. What a powerful tool to be able to listen to someone for 10 minutes and distill down their needs into a couple of sentences at the end. Um, so yeah, keep in mind, you don't have to have all the magic words to fix everything. You just have to be able to hold it with them thoughtfully. Okay, I love this video. I'm going to play. It's a uh, Brene Brown talk. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of Brene Brown. I'm sure a lot of you have heard this video. Um, it's discussing about empathy and empathetic listening. So you've got to put on your active listening hat and your empathetic listening hat. So, Lamare, will you let me know if you can hear it? Yes. So what is empathy and why is it yeah. very different than sympathy? Thank you. Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's, a, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, climb down. I know what it's like down here and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, it's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no, you want a sandwich? Um, empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Oh. 
Okay. So a couple bullets from that video is she says the process of empathetic listening is taking, perspective, taking the perspective of others. So slowing down, trying to put yourself in their experience and to just take that time and hear their experience. Staying out of judgment, so packing away whatever bias, whatever beliefs, whatever little voice in your head says, well, I would have done this in that situation. Pack it away. <laughs> you don't know the full situation. We can't, we can't start thinking and operating in that mindset because we also have no idea how we would respond in that exact situation. We want to recognize the individual's emotion, so name it, encourage them to name it, the beautiful thing is even if we name the emotion wrong, so if I were talking to a survivor that seemed really sad and I said, oh, I, I see that you're sad, I'm, I'm sad with you. The survivor may say, I'm not sad, I'm mad and overwhelmed. I'm just crying because I don't know how, to, how else to express it. That's okay, like, yes, we were wrong, but we still got to the end goal of recognizing the emotion. So then we can tap into ourselves. I've been so angry, I've cried. I've been so angry, it seemed sad. And so now within myself, I can tap into that like energy and that, that drive to be able to help that survivor and support that survivor better. So name the emotion. If you're wrong, they'll correct you and then you're still winning. And then lastly, communicate it and connect to that emotion within yourself. It's hard and it's not comfortable and it's gross to be vulnerable and to tap into those feelings to understand where the client's coming from, but it makes you better at working with these survivors who have lots of trauma and are in their fight or flight. And it makes you a better traumatic, like trauma-centered care provider. So you gotta connect with that emotion. That's part of why our work is so entrenched in vicarious trauma. Um, and it's, it makes our work hard, it's a very real thing. And then lastly, one of my favorite things she said is being a good listener doesn't mean that you have the answers. It means that you are a safe vessel to connect with. I think that ties back to Lamer's point of like mistrust of systems. If we can just be a safe vessel, that is the fastest way that you can form trust with someone. You're not making promises. You're not damaging a relationship. You're just safe. And you can say, man, that's a lot of issues. I don't know that I have the answers. And that's okay, because that's setting a real expectation instead of saying, I am a social worker. I'm going to come fix it all. And then when you don't, you've now created another system of mistrust for that survivor. So be real about your capacities and what expectations and opportunities there are. Um, and that's kind of like humbling. You got to eat some humble pie before you have these conversations. So, yeah. Okay, so survivors will have, not even just survivors, any individual that we encounter may have developed some protective barriers and behaviors over their lifetime. Um, again, I love this cartoon because this seems like a veteran with PTSD and when he was in the war, that behavior makes absolute, absolute sense. Like you wanna be in a bunker armed and geared up with your helmet and your bulletproof vest and your gun. But in a therapist's office where maybe they're revisiting some of the traumas of those experiences, those defense mechanisms don't make sense. So we have to keep in mind that even though we know that we're safe, compassionate people to connect with, we may be creating emotional responses that remind survivors of something unsafe or remind survivors of something that's going to pull those defense mechanisms up. So I may set a boundary with a client and say, um, no, you can't use threatening or abusive language in this space. And me telling that survivor no, and that the expectation is to not use like discriminatory language in a space may bring up a trauma response of a perpetrator telling them no for something or threatening something, or you have no idea what's happening behind the scenes in someone's narrative and story. So hold the complexity that you may have no idea where this response is coming from, but that it may be a learned defense mechanism that has served them really, really well in previous experiences. Um, the other thing we wanna hold is a language that I know has come up and that I see in services is like, this person is manipulative, this person is manipulating the system. That for us is the survivor has really strong skills and knows how to get their needs met. Like that is them, like getting creative and getting their needs met and advocating strong for themselves. And we, we need to be mindful of how we're going to label that as well. So. And I think that I'm going to add to that. I think there's also a piece of that 
that there's um, power and information in a sense. And one of the ways that somebody can keep power is by parceling out what information people receive, especially the more personal it is. And there's almost nothing more personal than like domestic interactions and family workings. Um, so there's a piece, then there's a desire to say, but wait, you told me this and it doesn't line up with this. Um, and somebody said, I was at something recently where someone was talking about also the fact that memories are not linear um, and they're gonna come out in various ways and trauma impacts that as well, so. Mm -hmm. Also that there's, if you do like the full Divis training with me, there's so much conversation around how PTSD and this trauma impacts what survivors will disclose. They may tell you something because they feel like, ooh, this person's gonna respond more favorably if I say I defended them myself, even if they never defended themselves. Or this person may judge me if I say I defended myself, even if they did. Like it's, there's so many tiers and layers and the survivor is trying to survive navigating the system. So they're trying to read and feed the service providers what they want to hear as a survival instinct and as a way to make a system work for them. So it's not, <laughs> we need to hold that complexity of, like, yes, absolutely. We're gonna see and hear different things. And as we get to know clients more and that trust forms, we're gonna hear very, very different narratives and stories and experiences because we form that trust, bless you. And because we've dug deeper into their experience. So yes, yeah, excellent. Um, another huge thing with domestic violence is confidentiality. Um, so when a survivor leaves the relationship, that is the most dangerous time. It's not when you're in the relationship. Um, when someone has made that choice to leave and has physically left the perpetrator's presence, that's when the perpetrator feels the most out of control and desperate. Something they felt like they were in control and had power over has left and now they feel chaotic and off kilter and they're going to do whatever they think it will take to bring the survivor back. Now sometimes that will look like making promises to change, that will look like um, saying they'll go back to school or they'll go to church or they'll do that workout class you always wanted them whatever the promises are to make it better they may do that and then that pendulum may swing into oh well those promises aren't working I'm gonna threaten you I'm gonna threaten your family I'm gonna threaten your mom they're they're escalating whatever way they can to regain that control so this is why it is so important when we are gauging with individuals we know are survivors of domestic violence, that we treat their information with the utmost confidentiality. Uh, so I have never met LaMare in person. We've only met over Zoom. I may talk to her about a friend I know going through an experience, and she may know that friend's partner. And I have just compromised that friend's confidentiality. And it may seem like a totally casual conversation. I don't know her. She doesn't know me. It's no big deal. But we have to treat everything with like the utmost protection. And I'm sure if you guys have interacted with domestic violence care providers, like you've been really frustrated by the red tape we have around disclosing and communicating things, but this is absolutely for the protection of the survivor. So we have to have a survivor sign a consent form before we can speak about anything. Like a cop could drop a survivor off at the shelter, pull out and turn back around and say, oh, she forgot her purse. And I'd have to say, I'm sorry, I can't confirm or deny. Like that is the level of protection because that cop might have gotten an arrest warrant all of a sudden and be circling back to arrest that. Like there's so many layers to that, that we really have to protect that survivor and make sure that we are only disclosing with the survivor's permission. And this isn't, I, I, go ahead. I, I was going to say, I think this is a slightly related um, that I meant to talk about too, is there something when somebody who's a survivor has gotten involved in the legal system or, or the juvenile system, um, they have an attorney. And their attorney, if they are any good at their job, has probably <laughs> told them straight out, straight out the box, don't talk to anybody. Don't tell anybody what happened. Um, they can use it against you. Uh, they can, people can be subpoenaed. They can be brought into court. So you will get people who may not articulate that as their reasoning, but will also like shut down for that reason and say like, nope, I got told and, and I'm going to go to jail if I end up sharing this with anybody else. And so, and I know that has impacted some of our clients. Totally. Yeah. And that like, there's, that's just one piece of that confidentiality importance. There's so, there's so much that legal safety, the perpetrator safety, 
just there's so many layers around safety with confidentiality with survivors. Uh, we also have federal confidentiality statutes that protect survivor information. So like federal law supersedes a lot of the protections and conversations that we're having to protect that client information. And we also want to be mindful that perpetrators are really, really creative in how they get information. So we have survivors that we've set like code words with their consent forms because their perpetrator might call and say, oh yeah, I'm so-and-so's dad because he knows that survivor might list her dad as like a reference if he's gotten lots of walls put up trying to call before. So we have to be really intentional about like how and when and where and why we're sharing that information. Uh, so yeah, just be mindful. If you're working with a survivor who has this experience of domestic violence, you may need to make sure you meet with them in a really intentionally private space. You may need to be mindful of what cases of their detail you share with other teams or collaborating agencies or even individuals in the community of that agency. Like it, you just have to be thoughtful. Um, and then be mindful about what details you share. So you don't have to share the whole picture to get like the root of the message. So I don't have to tell the survivor's entire trauma story to express that they're a survivor of really severe violence or really severe assault. And if a survivor trusts you with their story, don't parade the details out there. Don't dump it on other people. That's, that's a, a gift and a piece of trust that they gave to you. Um, and be mindful to not violate that trust as much as you can. Uh, unless it's necessary, unless it's a safety thing, unless it's like a healthcare, <laughs> like they need care or medical attention, that's a different conversation. But as much as you can, give vague information, not all of the nitty gritty. And then ask survivors what is and what isn't safe to share. So if they tell you that their partner is a law enforcement officer, that may mean like not calling the cops or being intentional about like if law enforcement work in your building or come into your building, what that looks like. Um, asking the survivor if they're comfortable with you sharing with your team all of these details or what pieces. And then also be really transparent and upfront about what you have to share. So suicidal, homicidal ideations. Uh, again, Lemaire touched on that witnessing domestic violence is a required reporting like child abuse report in the state. So we have to be really upfront as care providers of like, hey, if you disclose these things to me, I do have to report it. And then that informs the survivor to select and choose what, it gives them the full picture, it demystifies the process, it gives them that information to know how they wanna move forward. Okay, so protective capacity. Um, Again, Lemaire had touched on earlier about the intersection. You, you did so much of it beautifully. I'm so excited to come back through. Um, had touched on the, the intersection of the legal system and parenting capacities and domestic violence. We want to be mindful that, yes, we do have to report uh, to DHS if a child witnesses abuse. However, in the same breath, we can also identify and highlight the protective capacities. So anytime Divis is filing a report on the abuse, we're also running through a list of protective capacities that parents demonstrated, and we make those poor hotline workers like listen to us say, but also the mom has done these really great protective things. The parent has left the unsafe relationship. The protective parent has tried to file a PO. The protective parent has engaged in services. The protective parent is working with their unique communities of support. We wanna name these things so we're showing the complexity and the breadth and the depth of the situation. Because if we just call and say, mom was holding kid and dad punched mom, that sounds really bad to DHS. But if we say, this was the situation, mom was picking up baby to leave, dad punched mom, mom left and came to the shelter, that paints a very different picture that holds the aggressor accountable for their behaviors and shows the protective capacities of the protective parent. So that for us is what's really, really important is to create those, to paint that picture and make sure all of those complexities are identified. Um, again, perpetrators use the legal system as a means of ongoing power and control. This could be drawing out divorce and custody cases, filing lots of paperwork, um, filing protective orders, uh, filing emergency custody orders where people show up and try to remove the kids because perpetrator beat them to the punch in the justice system. Perpetrators may call DHS and file reports on how parent is an unfit mother and try to use DHS as a system of power and control. 
I mean, I could probably sit here for an hour and I'm sure Lamer could sit for two hours and rattle off <laughs> experiences we've had where the perpetrator has intentionally manipulated the system as a way to gain power and control or has more monetary assets to be able to play the game longer within the system, whereas the survivor can hardly afford the attorney they have. It, there's so many complexities and layers. Um, and then again, the legal system is inherently abusive. When survivors have press charges against their perpetrator, they have to retell their most traumatic, scariest story to a detective. And then they probably have to tell the detective again. And then they have to tell the forensic nurse what happens so the nurse can document. And then they have to tell a DA. And then they'll probably tell some random person in the victim witness center because they need it for some piece of paperwork. And then they may have to testify to that in court. This is re-bringing up all of this trauma and putting that survivor back in that trauma response which is just, it slows down that survivor's healing when you're having to re relive it and revisit it and be stuck in it. Or you've told your story to five different people and then they drop the charges because he pled guilty and signed an agreement. And now perpetrator has like 90 days community service or something. And it doesn't feel like there's that accountability or that protection from the system when they've invested so much of their emotional labor and their hope and their need and then the system falls short. So it's a complex messy thing and then again the system holds survivors accountable when the survivor really had no accountability to be held. So saying that the survivor was the aggressor when they defended themselves and just happened to leave two scratch marks versus the strangulation marks which only show up in about 15 percent of strangulation incidents. It's, it's huge, the disparity of how some of these things can play out. And just being mindful that because the legal system has said something or is approaching something or has determined something, we can hold the complexity and hold the survivor's story that what the system's presenting may not be the full breadth and depth of the story. Because it's always more complex than it seems. And, and especially that, because the system, is, the system is tweaked toward quick resolution um, the system is organized to push for a guilty plea. So it's also not only abusive, but it's exhausting. Um, and people come to court, and when we say come to court, it seems like you'd go to court, your case is scheduled at 9, and you leave at 9.15 or 9.20. Now it's more like your court is scheduled at 9, and then sometimes you don't leave till 4. Um, and sometimes you don't leave, you know, for hours, or maybe you leave at 4, and then you have to come back. Um, and so there's a piece of that exhaustion and abuse that is built into people going ahead and taking a plea for something that they had no part of because um, because that's that's where the system the system has been leveraged against them. And then again, information is power in all of this. Being upfront about what the steps of the legal process are. Um, so much of the safety planning we do around legal situations is just being very, very real about what the potential outcomes are and informing clients of what their rights are in navigating that system. Because a lot of the time survivors may not realize what their rights and options are. So be mindful and intentional with that. Um, and then also I wanna let you guys know that list of protective capacities I talked about, you guys should have included in that email. So as you're working with clients and making DHS reports, you too can now have a list of protective capacities to highlight in those DHS reports. Okay, last little stretch. So I'm gonna let Lamar talk a bit about Still She Rises. I think she already did. I think I already did. I think I pretty much <laughs> <laughs> what still she rises does um but you know and there's a there is also a piece i think some of you may have interacted with some people from still she rises or will in the future and um i think that's i can see it wrapped up in what i was talking about earlier with confidentiality and stuff i'm sure like some of that occasionally seems frustrating too so i just had two phone calls today where someone's like can you just tell me what's going on and i was like well I can tell you like one thing, but I can't tell you like the eight others that I actually know. And I understand that that can be really frustrating, but you know, part of our ethics um, specifically and in order to do our job is to make sure that we're keeping those confidences. Um, if we don't have extremely explicit, like Chelsea was talking about, extremely explicit, explicit permission to share um, things. And I know sometimes too that those things seem like that would be an obvious share. You know, obviously you can share, um, 
if, you know, if the person was assaulted and it's like, well, sometimes yes, sometimes no is the honest answer. Um, and so, and other than that, it was all that stuff I said at the beginning. <laughs> as, as you covered for my crisis. <laughs> um, okay, so Divis, uh, a lot of people think of Divis as shelter predominantly. I want to remind everyone that we have so many services outside of shelter. So even if our shelter's at capacity, which we tend to be at, we have outpatient counseling and case management services, and those services are for survivors and children. We also have groups and interventions for the batterers in the relationship. So we treat the entire system of the family that may be experiencing violence. We also have our safe housing program, which is shelter, and we have a transitional housing program um, that's 20 apartment units. It's a pretty cool two-year program for survivors to have safe transitional housing. We also have a legal team of protective order and court advocates. So if someone needs assistance filing out a protective order, if they're not sure if a protective order is the safest or best option for them, we have team members located at the Family Safety Center that can help with those conversations. We also have advocates actually embedded in the PO courtroom to support and brainstorm and offer safety planning and resources as they're going through that court process. We also have family court attorneys and a part-time juvenile attorney to help um, represent survivors of domestic violence in divorce, custody, and paternity cases. And then if you have any questions or want to connect a survivor with any of these resources, the easiest way to get us is through the crisis line. We also have a text line for safety planning. Right now it is only operational from 8 p.m. to 1 a.m. Uh, but survivors can text into that number and speak with an advocate about their safety planning and their options. And then we also offer crisis walk-ins. So if someone is in a crisis and doesn't know what to do, they can show up at our outpatient office Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 5, and talk to someone pretty quickly and get connected wherever we can connect them. So. All right. What questions do we have? Bless you. I'm going to deploy the feedback poll real quick, and then we'll move into questions. Give it just a few seconds. Looks like about half of folks have responded, so give it a couple more seconds. If folks want to jump in with questions, you're welcome to unmute yourselves or send them via chat, whatever you prefer. Hi, um, does Still She Rises still um, have a limit on a zip code? for people that they represent, or can it be all over Tulsa? Um, that is a fascinating and nuanced question. Um, we are, an, so it, so COVID impacted people. Um, we haven't mentioned it. It's the first training in a while. I hadn't had to say the word COVID. But um, when, we, when COVID first started, we expanded um, who we were representing to basically all women for a while in the beginning. And then as we are still a small and growing organization, we got overwhelmed. And yeah. so we've had to sort of retract back from that. So we are still primarily representing um, those mothers in North Tulsa. Okay, thank you. You're welcome.
when you say mothers of North Tulsa, do you know what the boundary is? Um, honestly, no. Um, the zip codes are sort of multivariate, and I honestly can't tell you all of them off of the top of my head since I am not generally the person on intake. Um, but it is, it's, I think a group right now of about eight, I think eight um, zip codes that are in the North Tulsa area generally. But of course those zip codes too sort of sometimes branch out. So I'm sure there, I know there are areas that we represent that aren't really traditionally North Tulsa as well. Thank you. You're welcome. But we screen and talk to anybody who like either comes to the office or gets information to us that they are interested in representation um, and go through a screening process. I was wondering if Chelsea might take a moment and talk about um, the types of clients, like just the fact that we, I'm at Divis too, that we are now certified to help sex trafficking victims. And then you might mention our, uh, that we have a um, place for male victims and that we have a kennel. Yeah. So I really briefly glazed over shelter services, but we, um, we're one of the first shelters in the state of Oklahoma to domestic violence shelters to specifically house male survivors of domestic violence. We also got to be the first to have a kennel. So we built a new shelter in 2015 that allowed us some really unique capacity to meet some unmet needs. Uh, we are also one of three certified agencies in the state of Oklahoma to provide services to survivors of human sex trafficking. So we provide shelter counseling um, and legal services to those survivors. Uh, again, it's a complex intersecting group to serve. A lot of the time the survivors of human trafficking that we see are not what you think of in like a Liam Neeson taken movie where people are being like smuggled and carried across state lines. A lot of it is what we call mom and pop trafficking where a perpetrator may force their partner to engage in sex work against that survivor's will uh, and may threaten force, fraud, or coercion for that survivor to engage in those acts. And that is a lot of the trafficking that we tend to see in Oklahoma. So it's not what you tend to think of. So if you work with survivors, keep your ears perked for any of that um, forced sexual engagement. So yeah. Um, so I got a question in the chat about confidentiality and domestic violence and asking about documenting case notes in a documentation system. That is a great question and a complex question. I think it's one of those times you want to be mindful of what details you're including. And I think that would be a beautiful time to ask the survivor what information they're comfortable with you including. Uh, at the shelter, we practice what we call um, collaborative documentation, where as we're doing our notes, we're talking to the survivors about what notes we're putting into the system. We turn our computer screens so they can literally see what progress we're typing and what goals, what language we use and what they see us setting. Uh, that might be, I, I think personally for us, that's the best way that we found to approach it. And our system is completely confidential within our agency. So I, I would defer to the survivor and asking them what their thoughts and preferences are and what would be safe. So, but a good question.
Any other questions, folks? I just want to thank Omer and Chelsea for this wonderful presentation today. And thank you for your time and your expertise and for sharing all the complexities and things to keep in mind as folks are working with survivors and how and all the strategies that you shared both for communication and um, for making sure that you're protecting the safety and the confidentiality of survivors. And I did want to let folks know we'll be sharing the recording of the training and, um, as I mentioned in the chat, uh, the handouts that Lamar and Chelsea uh, provided and uh, another pre-recorded piece on VAWA requirements for COC programs, as well as some forms to help um, programs comply with those requirements. Uh, if you have questions that come up, please feel free to email me, reply to my email with the materials, and um, we're always welcome your questions. Um, so thank you again, Chelsea and Lamer, for everything that you shared with us today. Thank you. I just want to say that I found it extremely informative and uh, enjoyed the presentation. Yeah. Thanks.